Well, hello everyone. Thank you for the, very much for joining us today for our Connect Talks Luxury Travel Wrap-Up Panel. My name is Greg Reeves and I'm the Commercial Director here at Connections and it's really great to see so many of you logged on, both old friends and new. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to Connections, the international private community for trusted decision makers in high-end travel. We help industry leaders from all corners of the globe meet and do business through memorable experiences that lead to long-lasting business relationships. Across our online community and calendar of events, Connections offers a year-round program that promotes brands, networking, learning, and recognition. Everything we do is highly targeted, time efficient, meaningful, stimulating, and fun. Now, this year has been extraordinarily challenging for all of us. And I wanted to take this opportunity to thank Connections members for their trust and support. Uh, we really value the support you've given us throughout 2020. As some of you know, we built our new online community in the midst of this pandemic in an effort to play our part to support the travel industry on the road to recovery and resurgence. Across our network, we wanted to bring together trusted decision makers to connect, share, learn and collaborate with each other. So far this year, we're proud to share that we've hosted over 12,400 one-to-one -one meetings for over 1,300 decision makers, which equates to over 6,200 hours of networking. We've also hosted 92 Connections virtual icebreakers and 50 live virtual experiences from all over the world. Plus, this year, our Connect Talks series touched on different topics pertinent to our community. Today, I'm delighted to kick off our 40th and final Connect Talks of 2020, a panel discussion with some of the industry's leading minds to conclude this year of travel, as well as look forward to what we can expect from luxury consumers and travel brands in 2021. This session shall last around 40 minutes, and then we'll go directly into our Connections social. So I'm sure it goes without saying everyone's familiar with Zoom. I encourage everyone to have your camera on as it helps promote interaction and makes everything a little bit more fun. You can see that most people have. And I also ask everyone to place themselves on mute, but please do interact and discuss your thoughts at any time by using the chat button, which appears at the bottom of your screen. So let's introduce our distinguished panelists. Dolores Gangontena, founder and public relations of Quasar Expeditions. Jacques Olivier Chava, CEO of Fourchon Hospitality. Stefano Alberto Russa, Senior Vice President of Operations, S Hotels and Resorts, and Vivian Chambers, founder of the Muse Collection. Thank you to all of our distinguished panelists for spending the time with us today. But before we begin, I wanted to share a little bit more about each and every one of them. So Dolores founded family-run Quasar Expeditions almost 35 years ago in 1986, then known as Quasar Nautica. For those of you who don't know, they've been voted the number one small ocean cruise line uh, by travel and leisure for the past three years. Prior to this position, Dolores was also an assistant to the director within the M Embassy of the USA in Quito. Her interests include Galapagos National Park, introduced species and endemic life in national parks. Dolores studied PR extensively in the US and Ecuador. Luxury and hospitality run in the blood of Jacques with roles at Louis Vuitton, Relais Chateau and Condé Nast for his current role as president and CEO of Fauchon Hospitality. Fauchon is 130 years old. It's a family owned company involved in French luxury gastronomy since 1886. An innovator in luxury contemporary gastronomy, Fauchon operates restaurants, catering cafes and retail outlets with a collection of, only, uh, of over 100 franchise shops, restaurants and 400 points of sale in 50 countries. Fauchon opened its first luxury boutique hotel, uh, Le Hotel Paris, and a new launch in Kyoto in 2020. And Jack will be focusing on growing this side of the business going forwards. Stefano has over two decades of international hospitality and F&B experience 
in luxury hotels and resorts across Asia. Currently overseeing hotel operations, including commercial activities, to ensure everything runs smoothly at S Hotels and Resorts Thailand. S Hotels and Resorts owns a total of 39 hotels with over 4,600 keys in top destinations such as the Maldives, Fiji, Mauritius, the United Kingdom, and Thailand, all of which are attracting a diverse number of tourists. And then last but not least, Vivian Chambers. Sorry, it looked like I was muted then by a member of the team. Um, Vivian Chambers started her career with JP Morgan Chase after graduating with a degree in finance. She soon discovered that her passion lay in the hospitality industry and shortly after joined the leading hotels of the world where she was responsible for event marketing and management on a global platform. Vivian was instrumental in maintaining the leading hotels of the world brand and creating market awareness for the portfolio of hotels. After a brief hiatus when her daughter was born, who I believe is on this call, she rejoined the industry as a luxury sales consultant for LXR Resorts, Waldorf Astoria Hotels and Resorts. In 2015, Vivian decided to create her own representation firm, the Muse Collection. Her portfolio includes luxury hotels, villas, and destination management companies in some of the most sought after countries in the world. So thank you to all of you for joining us. We really appreciate your time and let's begin. As we all know, the travel and hospitality industry has been one of the hardest hit as a result of the pandemic. Yet one of the most resounding messages we heard across our community is that the travel industry is incredibly resilient and will bounce back as soon as it's able to, most certainly for the luxury and travel industry. There is an incredible sense of togetherness and hunger to get back uh, to get the industry back on track. And in fact, Vivian, ahead of the election and vaccine announcements, you were already predicting a strong Q2 recovery. You told me that you were very bullish on this. What are your predictions for the industry now? Uh, thank you, Greg, for having us. Um, I am extremely bullish. Uh, number one, of course, you know, the vaccine has been a game changer. The announcement that already uh, vaccinations have started in the UK has been a welcome, welcome uh, news. We're starting here in the US on December 10th. It all goes according to plan, which it will. There's a lot of pent up demand uh, in the market. And I'm speaking particularly from the North American market. We love to explore. Uh, we have the time, we have, thank goodness, the resources. The stock market, as you know, has been incredibly high. So therefore there's money to be spent and people are anxious to get their lives back. Uh, so I am extremely bullish. That is a Wall Street term that which I had not used in a while. So I'm predicting January, February, we're still going to be a little bit behind in certain destinations, particularly city uh, destinations. But hopefully by March, April, May, we're gonna see consistent bookings coming in. And I think we'll end the year with a big ban in 2021. And moving forward for 2022 should be our best year on record. So I'm, I'm feeling really strong about it. I'm already seeing bookings. I'm already seeing a lot of inquiries, and not only for leisure travel, for also groups, for small groups. Um, so yeah, so we're we're ready to get started. That's fantastic. I love that you made the call as well before the election and before the vaccine results. I mean, now people are a little bit more optimistic, but yeah, you were very positive. Yeah, we, well, I have a crystal ball. I haven't shared that with anyone, but no. You know what, I think that because we have the finger on the pulse, we talk to our travel advisors uh, community almost on a sing, literally single day, every single day, excuse me. So we know what they're seeing, we know what they're feeling, we know what their clients are doing. We keep very, very close tabs on what's going on in the market and, and where we're seeing the shifts. And uh, we started to see it right away. As in September, October, as we got closer to the election and we were hopeful for a change and obviously we're not going to discuss politics. However, I think that the country was looking for a change in light of a very dark period, meaning with the pandemic specifically, that's what I'm referring to. So I think uh, all systems are a go. We may still have a couple of more weeks of hesitation on the part of some more conservative thinkers as far as traveling goes. But as you know, I've traveled uh, to Europe. I spent a month this summer uh, in September and August, and I visited all my clients in Italy. 
and I've escorted fam trips to Jamaica, Mexico, and now to the Maldives in January. We're sold out. We have wait list only, which tells me that people are ready to go. So no, no, I'm feeling really, really very positive. And I think everyone is feeling that same vibe, which will continue into the new year. Fantastic. Thanks, Vivian. And I'm sure we'll talk more about the Maldives shortly with Stefano. Uh, so, Jack, do you believe that this year will change, perhaps forever, the way business within the travel industry is conducted? Sorry, Jack, you're on, on mute. Cheers. Yeah, I've been put on mute, to be completely honest. <laughs> I was not on mute. <laughs> uh, no, that's obviously that's a, that's a very ambitious question to, to answer. Uh, as, a, as a CEO of a boutique hotel, five star hotel, uh, hotel chain, um, I, I would say there are a couple of things which are probably here to last for a, a certain period of time. Number one is that I would call uh, local. Everything local is the new marvel. Uh, there used to be a time where uh, everything had to be global. And that was not like long ago. It was just before the pandemic. Um, everything global was praised. You had a global concept for a global uh, team of staff and global suppliers and etc. I think it's completely wrong now. It's everything should be much more local, uh, which goes in the direction also of uh, sustainable development. So it's not only about the pandemic, I think the pandemic has actually accelerated a certain number of trends, which are very interesting. Um, we, we very much focus on, on local supplier, very much focus on local recruitment, and very much focus on local clients. Our FNB today is 80% dependent on local people. We have now 60% uh, of our guests coming from Europe. We have 60% of guests coming from America and Asia. So uh, clearly number one is, is local and this is here to last. The second thing that I'd like to say is, uh, and we all know it's flexibility. You call it resilience, you call it uh, uh, versatility, but it's about really flexibility. How you can switch uh, 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 the use of an asset uh, in very, very different kind of ways. Like uh, how can you, um, Make sure that uh, um, your um, your rooms are occupied, maybe at one point, by a long-term kind of businessman. And we realize that uh, businessmen they are very much willing to stay in leisure hotels now. That's very striking. For example, uh, room service. We said room service is dead because of the pandemic. Room service is booming. We have an average check of room service over 120 euro. People are taking great wines because they want to enjoy something of life as well. So I, th this is my double response. It's definitely local and definitely about uh, flexibility. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. And you mentioned that um, obviously a great portion of your clientele are local um, and also businessmen are willing to stay in maybe smaller luxury leisure hotels. Is that something to stay? Your belief is that's there to stay? Yeah, I think the people have in mind now to give a meaning, to grant a meaning to their behavior more than before. So you are you with family, it's got a meaning. You are with friend, it should not be taken for granted. It's got a meaning. So a, a, a business trip should have a meaning. It's not a way to just, uh, okay, I, I'm a bit bored with my uh, life in my, with my office, uh, okay. Why not have a meeting on the other side of the planet? No, I don't think that's gonna, it's over. This kind of thing is over. Uh, but I also think that um, trust is the key. Uh, trust in your uh, actually environment, in your distributor, in your uh, DMCs, in your, uh, uh, in all your partners. And trust is something which is, uh, which is not like a quantitative commodity. <laughs> You have, you have to establish trust in time. And this is where the legacy of what happened before, actually, pandemic is so valuable today. Fantastic, thanks so much, Jack. There's a lot we can take from that. And Dolores, on the, on the subject of trust, I think this leads in very well. Um, as a DMC, you successfully retained the majority of your 2020 revenue. Um, 
what steps did you make to, to achieve this? Thank you, Greg. By the way, I love Vivian's predictions. And I think we all are seeing part of uh, that prediction becoming true because uh, at least ourselves were getting a lot more interest as from March 2021 and onwards. Uh, I would say uh, about a question, uh, Greg, I think three main issues, and I will actually uh, get into uh, each one of them, but I think it was um, decisions, uh, action, and public relations. Uh, on, the, on the area of decisions, I think we had the ability and the agility to make important decisions extremely quickly. This was probably, and it is probably, one of the biggest advantages of being a small and family-owned company. By April 1st, we had already met with the boards, made important decisions, and then marked the road of what we thought 2020 was going to look like. By the beginning of April, we, had, we were already thinking about what was the worst case scenario. And actually some of us thought that it would be a recovery will not come but until July, 2021. Having this scenario in mind, what we did, and this was, I have to admit, very painful in the, you know, we furloughed most of our staff. Some of them had been with us for very long years. A few of them even decided to retire afterwards. And those who remained actually saw uh, reductions in their salaries of about 50%, that's from April. Uh, being a small company, all of us family members uh, took into our shoulders all of the big responsibilities that we couldn't ask other staff members to take over with reduced salaries. By April, by April 15, and this was extremely important, we had already sent out the statement to our clients stating what was going on and uh, especially giving them the reassurance of our financial stability. And that came about because uh, uh, throughout the years, we have always had sort of an, an emergency fund in the company. Uh, you know, to face situations like the one we're living through right, uh, right now. And that was able to give our clients the reassurance that we will be here even stronger when the, uh, you know, when the COVID will, will go away. So actually, I think dealing with the situation with full transparency was one of the uh, uh, stronger points. We informed our clients with extreme, uh, you know, with extreme clearness about what the financial situation wa was. Some of them even asked for bank statements, but actually it worked. It really worked because they, they just decided to stay with us and uh, you know, live with us this situation and these months uh, for the, uh, their clients especially to postpone their trip for the future. And I think uh, all of that turned out in uh, what is happening right now, Greg, uh, Luckily, we, we are restarting operations by this Christmas and New Year. Uh, it is true that by January, February, we do not have strong bookings. By, by, uh, by December, uh, by March, uh, things look extremely well. But that's where we are now. And thank goodness, uh, the big decision that we took at the beginning, I consider was the right one. Dolores, thank you so much. And firstly, congratulations. Um, it is really positive to hear that in December you're opening and that the books are looking good for, for you know, Q2 next year. So it's really you know, admirable to see how quickly you moved as a business and obviously the positive um, effect that had on, on your business and its, its survival. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Stefano, aspiring travellers need to be reassured and encouraged to travel. How are you doing this? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, before I answer that, I just want to second what Jack was saying with the local and domestic travelers, you know, being what, what moves right now the best. And, and also about his in villa or room service checks that has increased. You know, we have the same experience with beverage checks. More people drink champagne and wine than they ever did before in the hotels right now. <laughs> So obviously, um, to go back to what encourages and reassures people to travel, um, obviously Dor Dolores also mentioned it a little bit with the trust uh, that goes there, that she delivers as a DMC to the client. And we did that obviously as well directly through our guests uh, in, in whatever we are communicating uh, directly and through social medias to the guests. 
it was very important for us, you know, if I look at Maldives, and I, I'm going to talk about it separately, to be the first to open, because there is a hunger of traveling right now because of being engaged in our room so much uh, domestically and internationally what we experience in the Maldives. So we wanted to be there, the number one to open. And I remember calls getting, when is the first flight, you know, on 15th of July with Qatar Airways coming, we want to be on that flight, we want to be there. And we want to support, you know, not only the destination and the hotel. And all this was a result really on an open communication on what we are doing on all various platforms. And there it was key to, to communicate what is being done because there is a certain level of fear factor of traveling, you know, getting into that plane, reaching down in a destination that you don't know. And for us, it was very, very important to communicate what is being done. Now, we didn't solely focus on what is the COVID-related actions that happen on property, because that is the new normal. Everybody expects to have the sanitizers, you know, the mask of the team, but it was also very important for us to showcase and, and deliver what people can do to have somehow a normal life in the resort and, and communicate the wonderful experiences that you can have whilst being on place. And um, with that, we also had to count a lot on our guests who stayed there because the feedback we got in TripAdvisor or the social media, it was almost guests as ambassador telling all the guests, hey guys, you can go, it's a great place, it's safe, everything is under control, go and experience and live the life the way you did it before, you know, under the new rules and policies that everybody sets. So yeah, everything about communication and share what you are doing and share the good news. That's amazing, really, really. And in terms of, of getting your staff up to speed, because obviously you need all of the protocols in place, but the staff need to adopt that. Did you find that that was quite a smooth process as well? Like rolling it out across it was, the brand? Uh, yeah, it was very smooth because obviously the team embraces guests coming back and wants to showcase because you can imagine you know that's their livelihood depending on tourism right now so it has become a new norm everybody embraced it and everybody wanted to show that you can have an equally nice holiday now than you had in the past so the team was amazing the way they took over all the different additional tasks you need to imagine you know like like you mentioned downsizing happens but you downsize but actually you need to do far more work with disinfecting with extra cleaning you can't use the same buggy to pick you up than the one that dropped and all that so there is a lot of work so everybody does more for less and does it in an excellent way and really exceeds guests expectations and luckily they share it which is the tool for getting more guests back uh, congratulations stefano thank you very much um jack i've got quite a, a heavy question here which is uh are there any winners from from the pandemic uh i i guess greg you you invited some of the winners to your uh, to your webinar no <laughs> by the sounds of things yeah <laughs> no you know i would take the example of vivian uh you know, I think it's about two things. It's about being bold and it's about having values. Uh, oh, okay, and it is exemplified in the case of Vivian, which I've been knowing for so many years. And you know, this, this kind of uh, uh, personal energy that you can show. And we, we have seen people uh, all of, around us during these tough times with, with uh, boldness, with capacity to be the first to, to do something again. So we've been, for example, at our small scale in Paris, we've been the first five-star hotel to reopen. And we say, okay, it's better to be open than to be closed. We are not aimed to be closed. Even though we are supported by the government, this is not our fate. This is not our reason for being. And I think another thing which defines what a so-called winner, I don't know if it's the appropriate word, but uh, it's, it's it's, I would say, about uh, being in control of your future. And when it comes to very, very tactically, very concretely, when it comes to your channels, so-called of distribution, you have a very strong say here. You can define with whom you want to work. 
you can put apart some kind of, uh, I would say, uh, obvious uh, slash easy way to proceed, like maybe we used to do in the past by going a, a bit too much in the direction of OTAs, for example. So um, th there's a reward after this period granted to people who have taken a risk and clearly also to people who have been first to restart something, I would say. Fantastically, well answered. Thank you very much. Um, Dolores, how did you navigate the crisis as a leader with your own team? It sounds like a lot of the team have been with you for a long time. Um, and obviously this has been a big time of change for the business and for the, for the team. What could you tell us about the way that you've dealt with it as a leader? Thank you, Greg. Actually, and unfortunately, most of the commercial team, which is the one that I am uh, most in contact with in the company, um, had to be furloughed. So uh, the few that remained, it, we just had to work together. And I think we all decided that we were going to remain in constant contact with all of our clients, um, especially because we we told them, and I, actually that was that, we told them, listen, it is the time to support each other. And, uh, you know, those clients that had been working with us for years and years and years, just decided to work together with us. It was so important, you know, for them to know exactly what was going, to, uh, what was going on month after month. And, in, you know, we kept in such close contact, uh, constant uh, contact, Greg, that it really worked. You know, uh, we also told them and had them currently informed the updates that we had on Ecuador, Peru, uh, Chile, and Argentina, which are the countries that we sell. So they were, uh, you know, they didn't need to call anybody else because they had the updates from us. And uh, also I have to admit that the, if there was something positive of uh, the COVID situation for us, it was that it gave us time to think, to innovate, you know, we actually came up with uh, improvements, you know, in uh, procedures, in protocols. So uh, we started thinking, how do we return stronger and more efficient? I have to admit that one of the things that um, uh, is probably not positive about COVID is that because we needed to be more efficient, we are going to need less people in the future in the company, Greg. We created so uh, so many incredible reservation system uh, for for all of our clients to take advantage of. They're very efficient. It will provide you all of the information. So now, if, if before we needed two or three people to be able to offer to our clients uh, that information, now with a click you will get it all. So I would say positive in a way for the client and ourselves because right now with a click of a button they would get everything that before was being offered to them by two or three staff of the company. And I think, uh, uh, you know, I have to admit that this moment, if you ask me, are we more efficient than prior COVID? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Uh, you know, we, we had the time at long last to be able to innovate the new systems that we have, create new programs in each one of the countries that, uh, that we operate in. Uh, our financial department is now also a lot more effective and efficient with less resources. We learn to work with less resources. And uh, I think it probably it has happened to everyone in the trade. Uh, and that I would say is the downside of the old COVID. You know, I think there's going to be some jobs that are not going to be replaced when we, uh, when we actually, when this crisis is over. But yes, I feel that uh, those companies who were able to change, create, innovate are the ones that are going to survive because it has been a terrible time. None of us has been uh, almost, uh, for us, it's going to be almost a year uh, to, uh, you know, not operating. We, we, you know, we stopped on March the 14th and uh, we are only operating Christmas New Year. January and February, we will operate only if we have the requests. As from March onwards, we do have very good bookings and we will constantly operate. In short, we are going to be closed about a year. And I think that is the case for most, uh, you know, most companies, everybody's really suffering. So that's, uh, you know, that's yeah. actually how we navigated and the very strong relationships with our clients, calling them constantly. I think that's what people want, uh, it, you know, a personal relationship, I think, 
taking the phone and calling them and saying, this is what's happening. Uh, cover your clients. Would you like me to speak personally with them to assure them that we're going to be back strong and efficient? And it worked. It worked, Greg. I think that's how uh, you know, maybe, the, yeah, maybe the years of experience uh, gave us that sort of a, that little thing, you know, to allow us to face this very difficult situation. Yeah, I mean, really, the, the sort of resounding feedback is is the importance of relationships and the strength of the connections that you have in the industry. And I think um, it's very clear. It's also very interesting to hear your comments on automation. Um, you know, COVID may have accelerated a number of changes, and I think that's probably one of them. Um, companies right. looking at technology in order to be more efficient. And, and touching on Jack's point on sustainability, maybe it's bringing other things, other issues and uh, other responses to the fore faster than maybe we were predicted previously. Um, thank you for sharing that. It's very interesting. Yeah. Stefano, you're currently in Thailand, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, yes. But, <laughs> and so, well, thanks for joining us, because it's probably quite late for you at this point. Um, but I believe that you spent much of lockdown in the Maldives. Would it be possible um, to understand a little bit about the impact of travel and maybe the trends that you picked up on whilst being in the Maldives? Um, over the majority of the quarantine. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. So you're correct. I was supposed to come to Bangkok in March. I arrived two weeks ago. So I had a 10 month lockdown in the Maldives, which is, I think, the best place on earth to be locked down anyhow. No? But um, to, to, to get back to you on the, on, on, on the importance, no? Obviously, everybody knows Maldives lives of tourism. And uh, when the borders closed down and nothing came in, the entire country pretty much stood still. Um, and that's why it was key for the Maldives to find the first ever possible way to reopen to globally uh, as much as possible, since we don't have domestic travel as such in the Maldives, right? And um, that was super important. And in fact, those those uh, three months from March to 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 mid uh, July, the hotels used to optimize, you know, the operations to adjust and get ready for the operations for people to come back. And it was an amazing collaboration and partnership with the, with the Ministry of Tourism in the Maldives who really worked hand in hand to make it happen that uh, it's gonna be a, a safe and fast recovery for the, for the country. I think the, the, the airport got uh, accredited as one of the safest airports as soon as possible, you know, for the opening as well. Just giving all these kind of step of confidence for, for the travelers to come back to the Maldives. And in fact, one third of the hotel in, uh, inventory has opened up on the 15th of July. And another third came six weeks later and, 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 and pretty much the balance with a few exceptions opened up on, on, on November 1. So now it's, it's pretty much back, back, back on operation. No? And it was amazing to see how people travel from wherever, you know, it started up with a very strong Middle Eastern uh, uh, influx of guests. You know, the USA, Vivian was always amongst the top three travelers, uh, no matter uh, what happens, you know, from, from, from the beginning, you know, and, and, and so did UK and Europe. And in, in the beginning, we were kind of really amazed by knowing that there was a continuous lockdown, British still continued flying and people came out and whatever ways they found to travel, they made it. And, and we saw that and we see it also now having so many direct charter flights popping up and being an announced coming in. And um, again, for me, Maldives did the right thing, opening as, as, as early as possible with all the steps that they took in place. And um, our forecast for December this month far supersedes what we expected during July, August when the opening came. So very, very good news for the Maldives and, and a big thank you to the Ministry of Tourism there who, who assisted in, in the right communication and guiding us into these ways. Thanks very much. Stephane. It sounds like you did a fantastic job as well. I know it was very up there on the list in terms of UK outbound. Um, over quarantine. So it sounds like they obviously their communication was very effective indeed. Um, yeah. 
Vivian, I've got a question that's actually come in um, from, from someone in the audience. Um, Sarah's asking, and I'm gonna direct this to you, have any of the panelists changed their social media presence throughout the pandemic? Have you changed the nature of your approach to your social media, your personal brand? So this is a very uh, funny question uh, to present to me because I'm not a huge fan of social media on a personal note. Uh, I always feel it's all about self-aggrandizing. And if I wanted anyone to know what I was up to, I would call them and tell them. Uh, but of course, business, you need to be. So we have become incredibly active uh, Twitter and Instagram, and I don't know how many Facebook groups and LinkedIn. Uh, we, of course, have someone that we used to have under contract, but we brought somebody back that is managing our social media posting. So we post daily. It's become uh, very, very effective. So Sarah, to your point, absolutely. And it's something I highly recommend on a professional note, <laughs> not so much on a personal note. Uh, but yeah, no, for sure. And if I may add, uh, Greg, to Mercedes' uh, point earlier, sure. and to uh, Jacques, Jacques, thank you so much for your very kind words of support. I think, as my mother and my grandmother taught me, and I think when people say that your personal life is completely separate from your business life, I think that's a fallacy, number one. Uh, there may be some shades of difference, but 99% it's who you are. It translates to both. They've always said to me that a great partner is the one that stands by you in the time of need. Because when you're doing well and everyone is at a party, let's say at a wedding, everybody's having fun. And so they don't need you so much at that moment, right? They're happy, they're doing well. But if you're not there when they truly need you, when there's something is wrong, then you're not a partner. And I have to say, I'm very, very proud of what Muse Collection as a collective team has been able to do is that we voluntarily closed uh, our accounts, meaning we froze our accounts, many of them. We reduced others. It was done voluntarily. No one had to reach out to me to ask. I did this in March, the first week in March. And I continue to support all my members. They're my family, my extended family. And I think this is the right thing to do. I also don't think, and in this point, I don't agree, Mercedes, that yes, indeed, indeed um, connectivity and all these things may reduce staff in certain respects, not in my uh, field, because we're all about luxury. We're all about the personal touch. Um, so we won't actually, we won't reduce. We're going to increase our team. We have been very, very fortunate uh, to add to our collection. And I'm very, very, very grateful for that. But we've stayed super hyperactive. And again, Jacques, to your point, I made a decision in March, the first week in March when the doors were closing. And literally I was in Florida on a sales mission where doors were physically closing on us. And I said, I either stay in bed and watch Netflix or Amazon, <laughs> or I become hyperactive. I'm telling you, this is a decision. My daughter knows she is watching right now. And when this happened, she was not in the UK yet. And I said, you know what? My collection needs someone to have their back. And if I don't do it now, then you know what? I'm not going to do it. And uh, we pivoted very, very quickly. And we have now a much stronger presence simply because we really reached out as a community to the travel advisors, which I hold in the highest regard because you're the front line. So we did a two prong attack. We wanted to make sure that our hotels were not remiss in paying commissions. We're not remiss in doing cancellations properly and effectively supporting our travel advisors. And we supported our clients too. So I think, uh, listen, if you need to look at global companies also, because obviously I'm, I'm a very boutique company. I cannot compare to huge companies, but everyone needs to look at their relationships because this was the time to say, where have they been and what have they done for us? And if they were absent, or they didn't have your back as they say in the US, then it's time to rethink that relationship. So just wanted to add to that. Um, Vivian, would you say that, because um, I had another question, but I feel like you might have just answered it. Would you say that's been the key to your survival? It's not, you know what, I don't survive. I don't see myself as <laughs> surviving, I'm thriving, uh, which is very, very different. And I actually live by that philosophy 
uh, it guides me every single day uh, to put one foot forward and I, I love it. I enjoy it. It is stressful. It is challenging. I, I make no bones about it. There are days that are better than others, but I have to tell you, I don't survive. I thrive and I thrive along with all my partners because they deserve that and more. And I will, t and I'm, listen, I'm not advertising my company. This is not a forum for it anyway at all. But I, I absolutely am, I feel privileged to work with them. And somebody, Stefano, that I've just started working with him, but Jacques Olivier, I know him forever. Un freaking believable person, an incredible professional. I'm serious and I'm really fortunate. So, how did we thrive? By being extremely active in the community on both sides and being a good partner because that's what a relationship is, right? It's not a one way street, it's not about hi, I'm here and this is my invoice. That's really shabby. It's about what can I do for you today, tomorrow and beyond. And that's why we're still here and going strong. And it's thanks to all of them and thanks to our travel advisor community too. They're a big thank you to them, huge. Amazing, Vivian. You're very, very motivational. I feel like a, maybe a, a little daily update from you would be welcomed. <laughs> <laughs> Tell my daughter that so she calls me more often. <laughs> <laughs> we have Nino in the chat as well saying thank you very much for everything you've done for him this year. So oh. there we go. Isabella says, I call every day, sometimes twice. <laughs> That's true. That's true. You know what? You know what, Greg? Listen, all this comes from the heart. If you are not vested a hundred percent, it shows. And I'm a hundred percent. And you're right, we get to pick and choose who we work with. And we sometimes sever ties as they sever with us. That's normal. No one is here to pretend that uh, everyone likes you and everybody. But once you're in a relationship, whether it's personal or professional, you got to give it your all. Otherwise, it's on you if it doesn't work, right? So no, absolutely. that's what it is. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really, really good. So um, Dolores, I'm going to pass something um, back to you. Um, now, you've said, obviously, uh, there's been more client uptake. You're starting to see a bit of a recovery. January and February looking good. March is looking fantastic. What are your clients now looking for? Is there a change in their requests versus pre-COVID? Without a doubt, Greg. Yes, uh, you know, what we see changing is that right now uh, people are more conscious for sustainable and responsible travel. Uh, they want to know what our company is doing uh, towards conservation, uh, you know, all of that is, you know, has really raised in the interest of our clients when they are asking for, for spaces, be that in the Galapagos or in Patagonia, which by the way, uh, both of our uh, programs, Galapagos and Patagonia are at the moment the most requested. And amazingly enough, the request for extensions to cities have actually lowered. So they want to go to um, open spaces. They want to experience more nature. And uh, they now, when choosing, they prefer the small boutique hotel. Uh, they want everything on a private basis. Uh, what we have actually seen, which, which I find fantastic, is that um, couples who had confirmations with us for uh, 2019 and for 2020, uh, you know, have actually decided to postpone and they are postponing, but adding spaces for extra family members. If they were traveling on their own, just a couple, they now want to travel with their kids. So they're asking for more spaces so that they can actually travel as a family. We do see now, um, you know, a lot of increase in that sort of tourism, you know, making the groups larger with family members. And uh, nature, without a doubt, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say the alternatives that uh, passengers have nowadays are mainly, um, you know, trying to go to outside spaces, uh, travel with your loved ones, go on, uh, you know, and stay on a smaller properties, and especially try to do most of the things on your own with just the, uh, the help of a naturalist guide, but, uh, you know, try of avoiding groups. So in that respect, I think it's probably the way people want to travel uh, nowadays around the world. You know, I think as a company, we have had to make certain changes 
and start locating properties that you are able to charter. And I mean with that small little boutique hotels that you could actually get for your own use, you know, hotels that have only six, eight rooms. Uh, those are available in Latin American uh, big cities uh, at the moment. Actually, using the word Vivian was uh, using, they're thriving. That sort of property is thriving and is opening uh, is opening up a new offer for, offer for the you know for travelers. Before you know those properties were not doing very well. People preferred uh, more established chains uh, of hotels to stay at. Nowadays, they are taking the, the smaller options, the, the little boutique hotels. So I think in a way it's, uh, it's going to be good. And as everything in the world, the larger properties will just have to change, Greg. They will have to, uh, uh, to start offering new things, uh, um, you know, to remain competitive in this world. We all need to remain competitive. Mm. And for that, you need to use your innovation, your creativity so that, uh, you know, we have something to offer to this new client that is appearing after COVID. Fantastic, Laura. That does tie in a little bit as well with what Jack was mentioning about being local and, yeah, very much so with the, the, the smaller, more boutique uh, and buying out entire properties, villa rentals, they're not always easy to find. So I can imagine it's been a bit of a shift um, in regards to the sort of work you're conducting on the ground. And then Nadia is also agreeing. She's saying, very true, Dolores. I see that trend too. So thanks for sharing. Now, I have a question uh, for Jack. Jack, um, if I'm a business owner um, looking at post-COVID, um, what should well, what should I and what should my business be focusing on? Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I think it should be focusing on uh, what is probably the number one uh, asset you have is your staff. Uh, of, uh, I represent a certain kind of uh, hotel uh, in this uh, industry. Of course, it's five-star hotel, it's a boutique hotel, so it's very much based on human values and interaction with clients. But um, I have to say that we had the chance in Europe to be supported uh, by our respective governments uh, to an extent where people could actually, I would say, sustain the situation. But what was missing after a few weeks and months was the bond, actually, was the, the reason for being in a way, which is, uh, which is very, uh, at the same time, very striking and, and, and quite logical as well. And uh, as an employer, so to speak, and I don't like this expression, I, I uh, all of a sudden I, I uh, realized that I was not an employer. I was, uh, in a, in a way, uh, the um, um, the warrant of a certain community. And okay, that's big words, but it's about saying okay, this community that we've taken years to build, which is uh, about uh, bringing together this variety of. of uh, staff, experts, uh, managers, etc. In, in a very short period of time, it can completely disappear. Not because of money, mainly, but just because of lack of communication, understanding, reason for being, etc. So the, the, the three things which we did in order to avoid this kind of dilution is number one is bringing the team together. Clearly, and social media is a great tool, that's for sure. And especially with humor. It's not because it's pandemic that there's not always something funny to, to tell or to, to report, etc. The second thing is train, because training is not in life is something which drives you forward. So we have trained the concierge to do a check-in. We have trained the, the receptioning to serve a room service. So that was part of a game we developed uh, um, because we are with Fosho in 50 countries, with retail, with cafes, not only hotels. We brought actually bridge along all these people. And the, the third thing is, uh, was um, uh, about bringing and establishing a future. That's very, again, it's, it's a human basic. You need to understand what the future is gonna be. So uh, even though it's a game, even though it's a kind of drill, but you have to think of the future. 
So uh, how do we attract people from Germany to come to France? We had never had any kind of German clients <laughs> in our hotel in Paris before. How can we attract a long-term businessman to our hotel? That was absolutely not our target, et cetera, et cetera. So giving a future is, is also very key. So, so just to sum up this, uh, is really making a community of our, uh, our team. And this community would survive even when they would leave probably uh, our hotel because there's gonna be a day when they will leave or to do something else. But th this community will survive. And I think that's the most important thing. Fantastic, Jack. It was very strong and great leadership. Uh, it's really, really inspiring. So Stefano, um, what impact do you think increased digital transformation will have on the industry? Um, it's a, a good question and something that we gave a lot of thoughts and uh, in our hotels we implemented a lot of those uh, digitalizing uh, apps and, and, and stuff and I, I'd say it has almost become a new norm as well using them where I am now in, in Thailand everything is QR code scan you know and so it, it has increased a lot. Now, in our hotels, initially, we kind of thought, oh, that's not really luxury, have everything through the app, it's impersonal and all that. But we actually experience it pretty different. We also thought first that that's only something for young people. I, I know in this panel and all the members joining are young people, so they understand what I mean. But actually, we, we also realized that this has almost no age limit. You know, people, people embrace it and do it, and, and it gives a lot of benefit. Um, we, we give out digitally the people the chance to let us know when they would like to have the rooms cleaned or what kind of activities they like. And to go back to Dolores, you know, we, we all have to change, but getting this kind of information, we can be far more efficient and put the right amount of people into the right tasks at the right time, uh, which, which then actually the guest appreciates to get his task that he wanted to have done on that time that he wished no so this is one one item and what we also realized is that we proactively communicate let's say again obviously you don't have a high occupancy all the time if you look uh, the hotels that we have in the maldives with various restaurants you know we kind of communicate oh you know what the hard rock cafe has a great crowd please also come in and people get that on app so people attract people so it actually helps us to direct people and they can choose if they want to go or not but they realize you know what that that's great let's go there something is happening there and, and that just helps in the end to increase the guest experience even more no um so that's the part on, on guest experience side. And as I said, uh, new normal, you know, all the tracing and stuff, people can opt if they want to do that are there. We get the communication. So pretty much, pretty much a new norm uh, as well, a development out of the pandemic, you know, that further uh, maybe speeded up the, the use of it and, and optimizing those apps as well, you know. So for me, a uh, positive, uh, and almost becoming a tool that people feel, oh, you know what, what a luxury, let me just dial what I need, or I can just ask, is the spa available at that time? And you kind of get personalized answers back, and this is the, the beauty of, of those apps by now, no? Absolutely, thank you, Stefano. Yeah, quite right, <laughs> I mean, yeah, companies have had to really adopt technology that maybe they wouldn't have done in such record time, and that's not going anywhere after this. Yes. Very Absolutely, yeah. There we go. So we have only one more question that we really sped through that um, and amazing responses. And thank you everyone for, for your input in the chat below. And this last question is for Vivian. Which companies will thrive in 2021 other than Muse Collection? <laughs> well, I wasn't even thinking about that because mine is so tiny compared to so many incredible companies out there. The companies that have been able to reinvent themselves, the companies that have been able to support their teams. I think Stephanie was you who said, or no, it was you, Jacques, who said, our greatest resource is our teams. And that is absolutely, absolutely 1000% true. So those companies that have reinvented themselves, that have been able to read between the lines very quickly, that have not wanted to hang on 
to things that are no longer working, that have recognized that there is a change in the air and that to refuse that change in the air will only damage your growth or stunt your growth. Um, so I think those are the companies that remained very active in this time of crises will absolutely thrive. Those have taken a back seat uh, will be forgotten very quickly, particularly in this market that moves so quickly and we have short uh, attention spans. Well, I do. And uh, that's who I think. I think who has been with you, who has pivoted, who has been innovative, that's what's going to move forward. And there's a lot of opportunity. I've, out of every single crisis in this world, whether they're financial, economic, whatever it may be, there's always opportunity. You just have to recognize it and move with it very quickly to be successful. Thank you, Vivian. What a lovely and pleasant and optimistic uh, approach uh, to you. end with. So thank you so much for that. So everyone, um, we're about to start the social, but before I wanted to say a huge thank you to Dolores, Stefano, Jacques and uh, Vivian for your invaluable knowledge, time and views and for giving us so much insight. Um, this was personally very interesting and I'm sure many others have found the same. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you for organizing, Greg. Thank and you for having us. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks to you. Yeah. Pleasure. Um, and so everyone else, thank you so much for being here, listening and contributing. Um, as promised, we'll be sharing this recording uh, as soon as we can following the session. It will go on our YouTube and onto, onto the platform, etc. As I mentioned, this sadly marks the end of our Connect Talk series for 2020. However, we, we will be back on Thursday, the 21st of January, this time with tech expert Ewan McLeod. So following 2020, a year of accelerated digital transformation, Ewan will be separating the myths and truths surrounding the social media giants and learn simple tips and tricks to keep our behavior online in check. I for one cannot wait for that. I think it's gonna be very interesting and very important in 2021. If you're not yet part of the Connections community and would like to learn more about the community, please don't hesitate in getting in touch with any of the team, myself included. And once again, thank you for joining. This marks the end of the session.